country. Hi, I'm Bob Thurman, a professor at Columbia University and founder of Tibet House. And I also teach in Dharma settings occasionally, which I suppose uh, this particular set of answers to questions can be considered semi-academic and semi-dharmic. <laughs> Although ultimately there should not be such a division. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's what this is about. I'm doing this for the benefit of the Berzin Archive at the request of my old friend and former colleague and, colleague and former fellow student, uh, Alexander Berzin, Dr. Alexander Berzin. Okay. Why study Buddhism? What does it bring to people to study Buddhism? Well, I think in academia, like I teach a course introducing Buddhism to undergraduate students at various levels, and uh, that's really not an issue. It's in a religious studies uh, department, and um, it's a matter of sort of general learning about the nature of the world. Uh, there is such a thing as a religion called Buddhism, and you study its history, beginning with the founder, uh, presumably who existed, called Buddha. But in academia, everything is to be questioned. So you join uh, the Reverend Nagasena, Venerable Nagasena, in the Melinda questions of King Melinda, who already said, what, how do you know there was such a person as the Buddha? And there's an answer to that, even given in the second century before the Common Era. So you study all that sort of thing, and then people you learn about what many people in the history of the world, maybe a majority, considering the high populations of India and China, even in ancient time, uh, believed in. So you learn that, you know, then you learn that that's learning that's a world religion. Now, the way I really, however, I'd like to address it, not necessarily in academia, but not, when, not as concerned so much with the history. But I like to teach it in a sort of primary meaning uh, level that uh, Buddhism is actually not really what the Buddha taught. What the Buddha taught was three types of higher education. Uh, his Eightfold Path, um, which is the fourth of his Four Noble Truths, which is sort of his original framework of teaching. And Everything later in his teaching, or as expansive as it becomes, can be fit into that. But that Eightfold Path is a path of three education. It has eight branches which fit into three higher educations. Now, you read Buddhist translators constantly saying three higher trainings. But I consider that training is a better word for a soldier among humans, and maybe dogs and cats and horses and other animals who are trained to do this and that. Whereas uh, shiksha and is, it means education, learning something. Adi shiksha means intense education or a higher education, you could say. So the three education, higher educations are educations in ethics, educations in mind control and understanding of the mind and use of the mind, and education in wisdom, which means education in the nature of reality and in the investigation of the nature of reality, critical ex examination and exploration of reality. And those three higher educations really correspond kind of to um, the ethics one is sort of politics, so so sociology, society, you know, relates to that. The higher education in mind is relates to psychology, and, but really it relates to something we don't have in the West so much, which is training you how to use your mind where you change your psyche, actually, rather than what is your mind. Because in a way, that you have a mind is a given in Buddhist science. And finally, the most important of them, ultimately, to achieve liberation, freedom, lessening of suffering, lessening and freedom from suffering, uh, is the education in wisdom, which means the exploration of reality, which is actually science. And uh, so uh, Buddhism to why study Buddhism, you're studying, within studying Buddhism, when you look at it as the three higher educations, uh, then you are studying an ancient way of examining the nature of reality, a non-materialistic dogma-dominated science, 
uh, about the nature of reality with the mind involved. It isn't a spiritualistic or non-rational thing or sort of blind faith beliefs like people think of religion. That's how I think people think of religion as. But it is um, a very critical, rational, logical, but also empirical, experiential, and perceptual training and education in how to perceive reality. And the, and the learning about the use of the mind is in order to improve your scientific instrument with which you do investigate reality, which is your own mind. And your ethics really has to do with how you should behave to not to be in a turbulent lifestyle of conflict with other people by being more other sensitive, which means ethical, other regarding, as I think they say, some ethicists say, uh, about how you act with people so as not to provoke them, not to poke them, not to bother them, like some people I know don't tend to do. And so, so you study Buddhism to improve your ability uh, to, to use your mind to investigate reality see how others did investigate reality and how what they came up with in regard to theory. Although luckily, the Buddhist scientists, philosophers, you know, yogis, great masters, uh, like Buddha, did not have a dogmatic theory of the nature of reality because they decided that reality is beyond pinning down by theory. Um, and theory is very helpful in how to orient yourself in order to try to experience and to investigate the nature of reality. But the theory doesn't capture the nature of reality. The nature of reality is beyond theory, but it is not beyond experience. We do experience it, and then we tend to misinterpret our experience, as was Buddha's insight, which he called ignorance or misknowing. And so the idea is to correct that misknowing, to properly and correctly and fully know the nature of reality, which one Buddhist theory is that it's fully possible to do. So the best way of studying Buddhism is to study it not as a religion, but as a set of scientific theories, activities, texts, and traditions that you can employ for your own investigation. And just like when you learn biology, you don't consider yourself to be a member of the religion of biologism. So therefore, when you study that, you're using the services, the mental, physical, emotional, intellectual services that Buddhism offers human beings to become more aware of the nature of reality. And this brings me to my favorite slogan that I use nowadays after 50 years of teaching this, which is that what is Buddhism? Ultimately, Buddhism is realism. So Buddhism makes means that you want to know what reality is. And based on the, a certain faith coming from the experience of the Buddha himself, who said, wow, when you know reality, you're going to be free from that suffering, which comes from your misknowing your reality at the moment. So when you know it accurately and precisely, then you will be free of suffering. And that's a very encouraging and maybe, who knows, maybe overly optimistic uh, prescription, you could say. But based on that, there's a tendency in the Buddhist science to want to know more always about the nature of reality. Never to think that ignorance is bliss but only that realistic knowledge is bliss. That's, what, that's sort of the general uh, perspective and orientation with which one engages in the study of the Buddhist sciences. So that would be my answer to that question. Okay. Oh yes, now, Second question, what is the benefit of studying Buddhism as an academic subject? Well, there we go back to what I had said in the, in the other answer, um, where it is very valuable to study as an academic subject. After all, in academia, we have courses in the religious beliefs of other nations. We even consider secularism, perhaps, as a kind of religion of scientism or religion of materialism, something like that. We can say, if we really treat it in a sociologically sophisticated manner in the, in the tradition of uh, Peter Berger, Thomas Luckmann, and other great, what they call themselves, sociologists of knowledge. Um, and so but among that, Buddhism is a major set of human phenomena, historical phenomena and social phenomena, which involves many people's beliefs, many people's activities, uh, many people's um, 
theories and um, institutions that they built and so forth in many different countries, texts which were translated into many different languages with greater and lesser degrees of accuracy and success, and uh, also the histories of individuals who found great benefit in practicing uh, the Buddhist uh, educational method uh, of, of their ethics and their mind and their intellects. And um, so, and their realistic uh, experiences. And so, um, studying all of that is sort of what academic study of Buddhism does. And uh, that's very, very valuable. And uh, for some, it could be an entry after studying academically where they'd want to be a Buddhist. But in academia, fortunately, one of the great things about liberal academics in the world is that there is no preferred dogma under which people investigate things. And so, although, uh, on, at least in theory. In practice, of course, teachers do bring their prejudices. And I would say that the secular prejudice that you find, which is the dominant motif underlying um, American university campuses, and I think to a certain extent European ones and modern Asian ones as well, is that secularism is sort of reality. And that's not presented as if it were a theory, that's presented as if it were a fact. And in that sense, it is kind of religious. In other words, you just have to accept it, that only matter exists, mind is uh, some sort of old-fashioned superstition, a spirit, forget about it, that's an ancient uh, religious fanatic thing with no evidence to back it up and so on. I'm afraid that is actually the dogma of our academies, in which the natural scientists are something like the high priest, the social scientists are wannabe high priests, but they are good in helping us study the nature of human behavior and social behavior. And they are wonderful traditions, actually, and disciplines. But there's a little bit closed-mindedness about it because of the dogma of materialism that rules on the campuses, you know, which is a good, actually, response to the former kind of Christian university or Buddhist university or Jewish university, Shiva type of place where you have a dogma of some religious belief system. So this is a, but this unfortunately has become a new dogma of a materialistic belief system. And in a way that then prejudices people. So for example, in philosophy departments in America, you don't get to study Buddhism in a philosophy department, really. You have to study it in a religious studies department where it's sort of a human phenomenon. And there it's dominated by the idea that the founding principle of Buddhism, which is that it's possible for the human being to achieve a higher type of consciousness, a Buddha consciousness, awakened consciousness, an enlightened consciousness. And that kind of consciousness sees deeper, sees better, more accurately, more precisely in the nature of reality uh, than, uh, than ordinary uh, misknowing consciousness. And so Buddhist studies kind of a little bit politely tiptoes around that idea, which is at the foundation of Buddhism, but basically is based on a disbelief in that belief. So, for example, in PhD, people who get PhDs in Buddhist studies have to kind of accept a dogma from their professors, at least a little bit more stringently than nowadays. But in, when, when I was su early on supervising PhD dissertations, you know, 40 years ago, you know, you can't act like there is such a thing as enlightenment. If you do that, you're accepting uncritically some um, you know, crazy people's uh, predisposed idea, and you have to sort of automatically assume that Buddha was just a kind of Socrates, he had an orange toga, he didn't drink a Ritsina, you know, he criticized the gods, but he talked to the gods, supposedly, so in a way there's a presupposed idea of theistic idea in Indian culture, but he didn't exactly subscribe to it, but he didn't, he didn't completely cancel every aspect of it. In other words, he relativized it. In other words, he said, oh yeah, well, I talked to Brahma the other day and Brahma admitted to me that he didn't know how the world worked because he didn't actually create it, but he's a big, powerful being in it. So that kind of idea, you know. So what is that? That's hard to know, you know. Anyway, still, whatever predisposition you're studying it, even if you study it in a Catholic university where the predisposition, like by a Jesuit teacher or something, is that Buddhism is untrue and that there is no such thing as a Buddha, he was a person who was a you know, clever person and a teacher of people, but since he didn't, he wasn't Christian, he couldn't be even not only 
and not enlightened, but he couldn't be saved even. So there's that kind of a predisposition on top of it. But it, it, nevertheless, even under that, to learn about it is still useful. To learn that people believe this, they did that, they meditate the other way, they had this and that institution, they had this and that ethical theory, they had this and that philosophical theory, is very valuable anyway. So, so not to worry. Uh, whatever you do in that light is fine. Okay, so, so that's the value of the academic study of Buddhism. By the way, we're supposed to be recording this in audio mm -hmm. on a Zoom, but we're not. Let me get the audio off of here. I know, but we're supposed to, they say that that kind of audio, camera audio, What's going on? Okay, so the next question, is Buddhism a science? Uh, I guess anticipating me, Alex asked that, Dr. Burson asked me that, and um, I would not say Buddhism is a science. I think that would be, um, you know, if we think of Buddhism, the ism part means sort of the, it relates to being a religion, you know, like Hinduism, Confucianism, Taoism, Christianism, but we don't use, we use Christianity as a general uh, suffix. So ism sort of automatically assumes a religion. And I agree that Buddhism is a religion for those who do not use its educational system very fully. And in Asian history, since most of the societies for a long period of time were um, uh, sort of semi-literate or very non-literate societies, and very few people were educated, only the upper classes, and then later, later Buddhist monks and nuns, once Buddhism was in that society, were literate. And so your unliterate farmer who would be taught a sort of pious sermon by a Buddhist monk or basic ethical precepts, etc., and, and might observe the example of Buddhist monks being self-restrained and not over-emotional and not like angry and so forth, hopefully, usually. Um, so for them, it's a religion. In other words, they believe that the Buddha must have been a good person, perhaps enlightened, whatever they think enlightenment might mean. Um, they have still divinities. Buddhism never took people's divinities away from them, but it just de-absolutized them, relativized them, made them maybe less fanatical or tempted to. And so for them, it's definitely a religion, you have to say. But was Buddha's main purpose to found a religion? Uh, I don't really think so. He, he more was rebelling against the Vedic, what I call Vedism, or Vedic Hinduism, you could say, or Vedism which believed that Veda was the word of God, just like fundamentalist Christians today believe the Bible is the word of God, or fundamentalist Jews believe that the Torah is the word of God. So they believed the Vedas were the word of God, and they followed priests' uh, injunctions, and they didn't consider that you rationally had to somehow understand it, that human rationality had shaped in some way these teachings supposedly received in visions or revelations from God. And so uh, he rebelled against that, the Buddha did, and he felt a human being could understand their world and their reality, and he was definitely tried to do so. And he felt finally that he was successful. But in, in a way, ironically, in succeeding, he said what exceeds, what succeeds is experience. You can, you can experience, your understanding becomes experience, realistic experience, and then, then you're really uh, in touch with reality, let's say. And uh, unfortunately, that the way reality is, is beyond encapsulation in any theory. Theories are useful, however, as part of it in giving you an orientation toward uh, developing valid experience, but ultimately experience rules. And I would say that modern science is the same as that, and they say that experiment and uh, measurement and evidence supersede theory. And theory is hypothetical, awaiting dis either confirmation or disconfirmation by whatever degree of data and evidence that you have. And in that sense, uh, data and evidence is gathered by experience, which they call experiment, and they consider it to be sort of mathematical measurement, perhaps a quantitative me measurement, but uh, that's just they are based on them being ruled by a particular dogma that the mind is not an active energy in nature, uh, which is kind of funny when you think that, you know, they pose this puzzle, how could the mind matter when everything we can observe is material? But actually, uh, energy has no mass. 
And so you can't say in a way that it's matter in the same sense as something that has mass is matter. You know, so like an atom or like a, a, a something made up of atomic particles, like a box or a chair or a floor. So how does a not thing without mass affect thing with mass? It's there. There's a kind of puzzle even in that. And um, going to which goes to show you that the ancient Buddhist insight that words themselves are only partial um, sort of facets of the things they seem to refer to. And the, there's no essence in a thing that the word captures or refers to it as old fashioned Western metaphysics and, and old fashioned Vedist metaphysics thought. Buddha was rebelling against and criticizing those things, you know. So, um, so I would say that there, the main thing about Buddhism, especially that's of use to people who don't intend to become Buddhists, and in the modern world where religions are all rubbing up against each other in the same cities, the same communities, the same towns, and where religious pluralism seems to be the only social uh, practice that is in a way um, conducive to social harmony, therefore in such kind of multi-religious uh, societies. Uh, then the the leaders of Buddhism that I most respect and I think are most reasonable in relation to the modern the reality of modern societies like the Dalai Lama, who say that they don't want to convert you to Buddhism, that it's not necessary to try to convert each other, and 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 he requests, he deeply implores Christians and Muslims and Hindus, and Taoists if he had met more of them. Uh, not to try to convert people to their theory, and actually we should be imploring secularists not to try to convert people to their materialist theory, but rather see what good things they have achieved with their different theories and share them and let other people adopt them without necessarily having to enter into the body of those theorists or sort of some some membership, uh, you could say, in in another religion or convert to that religion or convert to the anti-religion religion of secularism, whatever it is. That would be preferable that we don't do that with each other. And instead we offer the services that the Buddhist sciences have elaborated that could be helpful possibly to us in our scientific approach toward the nature of reality. That is to say, our activity uh, focused on seeking to know what is real and differentiate it from what is unreal. And to develop wisdom, which ultimately is scientific wisdom, in the sense of its reality-oriented wisdom, uh, at least as uh, defined in Buddhism. Pradnya, you know the word pradnya or jnana, uh, those are such words. So that's what I would say about that question, whether Buddhism is a science. I would say, however, since Buddha's intention was to educate and re-educate people, to deprogram them, to help them deconstruct their indoctrinations in different societies and in different tribes and things about their identity and the, and, the, and the nature of the dogmas about the nature of the world, including the nature of the gods and the de demons and the, and the physical properties around them and so on. Um, and, then, and then openly try to experience free of any programming, the nature of reality, and then based on that experience, come up with new uh, sort of provisory theories, relativistic theories that make uh, people enable others to help them understand and enable us to interact in a harmonious manner and so on. So I would say Buddhism is more than a science and more than a religion and has elements of science and religion in it, which coexist quite okay, actually, in quite a decent manner, as, uh, as, as, can, as different world theories and worldviews can coexist very well as long as they don't, no one of them presents themselves as the absolute, the one that's absolutely true and real, and those who don't know it are somehow benighted, and therefore they have to be, uh, you know, thought, you know, brainwashed not to, not you know, to to believe the the theory that the absolutist is trying to impose upon them. So that is where we Buddhist science of the nature of how worldviews and a sense of identity are formed in people. Uh, and in society is, is very valuable to us, a valuable service to relativize, if you will. In fact, I would say just in general, which uh, under this topic, that in modern thought and philosophy, either ethics or metaphysics, although basically they all claim they quit metaphysics, 
because they create absolutist old-fashioned metaphysics, you know, essentialist metaphysics. But that doesn't mean they've quit metaphysics from our view. But anyway, you know, in other words, they, you know, philosophy focused on what is the nature of reality, and which is what metaphysics means philosophically. And um, that in those fields today, relativism is considered a kind of a bad thing and is equated with chaotic nihilism and sort of someone who could do anything, get away with anything, you know, just things, of, things, things on the fly, you know, has no real rules that they care about and so on, something like that. And I think that's unfortunate. And it's a, it's a natural tendency among those whose cultural predisposition is to have absolutist rules, absolute rules, that come from some absolute source, which is from old-fashioned Western theism, Abrahamic theism, and uh, therefore feel uncomfortable no longer having such an absolute uh, sort of guideline about what how you should live and what's the meaning of everything and so forth like that and think that and therefore fear nihilism and therefore look to a new absolutism which of course is then the absolutism of materialistic science and becomes absolutistic scientism however i think one service that buddhist philosophers can offer is offer a vision of relativism as a nice middle way between nihilism which is really anything goes and therefore dangerous, and absolutism, which is only I go, or what I believe goes, or those who agree with me go, and other people don't go. So put it that way. So relativism is, is but we all go in ways as best we can, trying to get along with each other, and our truths are relative truths, which mean they are valid and they are not false in a relative context. But we always want to be looking at that context and realizing others may see things and have create a different context. And then in different contexts, they won't be absolute. So it keeps our critical mind going, even in relation to the rule that we're following. So those are, you could call relative rules or rules that are good enough in specific situations, but not, not needing or requiring to be absolutely good. Something like that. Okay, unless you have a definition of absolute that it just means something you're very firm about, like not killing people should be, we should be very firm about, so we can be relatively absolute about that rule, but only relatively, not absolutely absolute. And Buddhism is very good at this, de-absolutizing things and deconstructing false absolutes and all absolutes in a way in the relative world are false, except for that one, that the relative world is relative. That's kind of like, a, that's, that's, Relatively absolute, you could say. Something like that. Okay? Okay, that's on whether Buddhism is a science. Ding! Do you need... Is the monastic tension relevant for today's modern world, especially in the West? Definitely, in my opinion. And here I provoke laughter... So the question is, is monasticism relevant for today and is especially in the West and in modern society? Do we need monasticism? And of course, in our Protestant ethic dominated societies, even though we do have Catholics in them and we do have Buddhist monks and nuns and things like that in them, which are really the only two traditions that make much about monks and nuns. Actually, the Hindus lately, since Buddhism disappeared kind of in India, they pretty into their swamis who are celibate, in that sense, therefore monks. And I guess there are some female celibates who you might consider nuns. And um, so because the celibacy is key to monk and nun, you have people who call themselves Zen monks, but they're not celibate, and therefore they're misusing the word monk, I'm afraid. They're Zen priests, they certainly can say that, or Zen reverends or ministers, you can say, but they're not monks if, they, if they're married or if they have girlfriends or whatever, or boyfriends, you know, they're not monks and nuns. But they do that because of not knowing the history of the Zen tradition from the Meiji era, 19th century Japan, and how the government didn't like celibate people and therefore made monks marry to, to make them more socially acceptable, something like that. Okay, but do we need them today, these things, therefore? Now people say. Now, here the Dalai Lama laughs because I was a Buddhist monk briefly in my 20s for about four and a half years. I was formally ordained about a year and a half. 
and I lived like like a monk, celibate and abstemious, and with the vows of poverty and study and etc. Uh, for for another three years before that, I was like a novice, you could say, and. Um, then after a while, I quit. I resigned, and I decided in my case I had to be better to be a lay person. And after doing that, you know, my wife rightly doesn't take responsibility. It wasn't like I fell head over heels and rushed off and ripped off my robes. I had already decided not to be a monk. And then actually, among the women that I met subsequently, uh, I happened to fall in love with someone. And um, so therefore, Dalam. But and then I followed the American or Western theory that you see quite a lot of. Here are quite a lot of in Buddhist circles, Western Buddhist circles, that you know those were fine in those Asian societies, but we don't need to be monks, and we learn a lot from our wives, which in male cases is very true, and from children and having to raise children, being responsible citizens, and therefore you know we shouldn't bother with the the monastic order particularly, and we can have a sangha community, which are Buddhist practitioners who are lay people, and that's more important for us here in the West. And you hear that a lot, and I subscribe to that for a while. Naturally, one wants to rationalize one's own behavior, as you know, what one did was a, the cutting edge and the new wave of what should be done in the world. And I subsequently studied more carefully Buddhist history and world history, and I realized that the great problem of the world today, one of the two greatest problems, or three greatest problems in the world today, is militarism and military violence and military, you know, budgetary expenditure and weapons and weapons trading and dealing. This is a huge problem and could be self-destructive of the human species on this planet, at least. And I realizing that, and then I looked in history that where has there been a social antidote to militarism? And lo and behold, to my amazement, I discovered the only effective one in history has been monasticism as an institution. And um, there are different kinds of monasticism, they're not all of course the same, but the idea that the male, particularly male, but female also, but particularly male, that the males of a certain age would put that kind of macho, do or die attitude that we find in military training into finding the nature of their reality, gaining control over themselves, developing self-restraint, developing compassion and positive, also um, a strong positive mentality, wisdom, uh, and overcoming ignorance and greed and hatred and envy and pride and this sort of thing in a sort of militant manner, like a military. That's monasticism. And Buddha was raised to be a general, I realize. You know, I guess we all assume that Buddha went to a liberal arts college when he was a prince in addition to partying, but he didn't. He went to a military academy because he was a prince, and princes are expected to be commander-in-chief of the society, so they have a military training. Of course, they do learn some liberal subjects, but they are trained to be generals and to marshal bodies of men to fight to defend their nation state or you know a little bit blown up tribe into a city state and um, in his era and uh, so uh, so he founded an institution that was a counter military institution actually where people would receive the respect and the veneration and the subsidy in society that normally only soldiers receive and um, in uh, in founding that he created this antidote in the society to violent militarism, in a way you could say to violent non-violence. Oh, you know, the monks, because the monks are sort of violent with themselves a little bit, although he made a big point, even an example in his life, not to be too self-mortifying, but still they are somehow self, um, you know, restraining and renunciant. And uh, so that, in that sense, like soldier, and they, like soldiers shave their heads not to have lice in barracks, and they don't have women in the barracks in the old-fashioned uh, stores, but which means they behave badly when they because they're not fully celibate by vow, but they are celibate in practice. And monks are celibate by as by as practice and by vow. They shave their heads because they live in dormitories a little bit, or in close quarters with other monks when they're not living in nature in, in the societies with the climate appropriate to that. And so. So monasticism, now since militarism is our major planetary problem, one of our major planetary problems, a really dominant one in the sense that it could lead to our self-destruction, 
then we need the, we need the services of a social antidote to that social institution that is so powerful. And therefore, Catholic monasticism, which already exists, is an important institution, irrespective of whether the view is a Buddhist view or any other view. The fact that it leads men, and women too, but especially men, uh, who are the, the, the Rambos, you know, have been, at least here for most societies, the Rambos, uh, to turn that kind of macho boot camp training into monastic boot camp training of how to be nonviolent and how to be gentle and how to be self-restraining in their negative emotions and negative actions, like killing people and taking their stuff and, and um, abusing and then looting and raping a society that you conquered and so forth, which, which soldiers do. And those are the really wrong things to do with other people and unethical things to do. So, um, so very much, uh, and, and that's where Solonis teasingly says, I'm the most enthusiastic ex-monk about monasticism. He thinks that's very funny. <laughs> and so do I. Do you need to be a monk or a nun in order to make significant progress in the Buddhist path? And here, um, of course, different people have different opinions. And um, I would say from the history of the tradition, you do need to be someone with equivalent determination and the equivalent prioritization of a monk or a nun, meaning that spiritual evolution and spiritual development and spiritual practices and scientific practices become your highest priority <coughs> in life. You live for... I would answer that question, do you need to be a monk or nun, in the, perhaps in the affirmative, because it may be that you have to have that level of prioritization in your life where making a living and uh, being famous and uh, being powerful and uh, having uh, sexuality and sexual relationships and so forth is, is you swear off of all those things and they are at your below, some of them below the lowest priority, so you just don't engage in them. And you, and, and you have to, of course, be in a society where people will support your life, feed you, meaning, and allow you shelter and allow you freedom from social duties uh, in order to be able to do that, because committing suicide is not an option for attaining enlightenment or going and living and starving yourself to death in a cave. That's not the way you can attain enlightenment. It takes it too long a, and too lengthy a process, even for the brightest human being. And um, so you need to have that level of prioritization, if you, even if you are not a formal monk or nun, and um, where you've really become determined, this is the high priority of your life. I'm going to develop my compassion. I'm not going to give in to my anger and my lust and my greed and my envy and my, and my pride. And, my, and I'm not going to be sunk in depression and delusion to the sort of life and death level, no way. So, so when one makes those resolves and puts the priority to be undoing those things that cause suffering of the human being and then close that human being off from enlightenment, awareness of their own reality, which means awareness of their own reality, uh, then you do need to be that. But it is possible in the modern economy, and especially in a country where they don't really respect monks and nuns, which I'm afraid most of the industrialized Protestant ethic dominated societies, they really don't. And it's particularly in those societies that think that everything you get out of life, that the only goods in life are those you have to get in this life. And because you don't have a future life, because your mind and spirit do not exist, actually. They're just, your brain makes you think they do, but you don't. You know, under the sort of dogma of materialism, the scientific worldview that you learn, that people learn in high school, you know, and grade school and college and so forth, even if they're humanist, literary people. Um, in those societies, there won't be social support for people who make the highest priority their spiritual evolutionary development. And therefore, in those societies, I think it would be possible for a person to gain enough livelihood where they have enough wealth to then be able to be kind of on retreat year after year, at least for a time. And sort of be part-time monks or something like that, or be 
be inter, you know, a few year long monks and things like that. And in that case, you don't need to be a formal monk or a nun, but in a way, for some period of time, you will be the equivalent of a monk or a nun. And then going in the other direction, monks and nuns in Buddhist history, and especially in the latter phase of Indian Buddhism, and in Tibetan Buddhism, and Mongolian Buddhism subsequently, it could be that some monks and nuns but relatively few, but a small percentage of monks and nuns reach a stage as a monk or a nun where they need to go on into other types of practices where the monk or the nun vow, particularly in regard to sensuality, could become a bit of an obstacle in certain types of practice, not necessarily for everyone, but for some. And therefore, there is a tradition where, like in the case of someone like Naropa, or the many of the famous adepts in India who resigned at some stage from being monastics and left, or sometimes they were thrown out of monasteries because they were infringing on certain basic rules, often having to do with sensuality. And, um, and in those cases, therefore, the monk or nun avocation is not necessarily permanent for a person. But those are exceptional, and, uh, and uh, they're very carefully um, noted in the tradition as exceptional because otherwise, you know, young people in, in adolescence or in their 20s when they're sexually very vibrant and vital would think it's absolutely essential I can often have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and I can still be focusing highest on my spiritual practice and although I have this boyfriend or girlfriend I'll be doing high level spiritual practice with them. Well, um, uh, that's uh, so then then they will all leave the monk and the nunhood and so that's so those people who are not yet really at that stage and there's a definition of what that stage is they already have had some kind of a visceral level maybe not total but some viscerality of their level of understanding of selflessness or emptiness or or identity lessness or reality lessness all of the terms that you have for that uh, that uh, great negation that great transcendence of the rigidity of self identity you know, they have to have some taste of that, at least, if not full level of it, uh, which comes only in full enlightenment. And they have to have some sort of positive attitude, uh, which, uh, which is the Bodhisattva attitude of everything I do. I want to make it to, I want to make love my highest priority. I want to be loving and gentle and tolerant of other beings. I don't want to be violate them in any way. I don't want to harm them. And I'm determined not to and so forth. There has to be that kind of a level. And, um, and in a way, in the Buddhist case, uh, to be uh, everything, even if I do things that are not in the, uh, you know, if I engage in sensuality, if I engage in, in things that I wouldn't normally engage in as a monk or a nun, I'm doing it for the purpose of attaining enlightenment for the benefit of all beings, becoming a perfect Buddha for the benefit of all beings, and actually accelerating that evolutionary development in a single life or in a few lives type of thing future lives as well as this one. So, so those things are required in order to, you know, if you have been a strong monk and a nun and then you reach a level where then you need to maybe interact more with others in a different, in a more, a less rule-governed way and then you, then it's acceptable to resign as a monk or a nun. And that isn't articulated very much because it's considered to be so exceptional in history. And maybe we need to articulate it more now actually to make people realize that uh, monkhood and nunhood, if they're very, very sharp types and they have a very strong desire to be really a complete Buddha, not just some calm down person, um, they, it would, might be good for them to be aware that, well, there's a level where then the monk or a nun thing is not, is not perfect. And you could have rigid monks and nuns who then behind the scenes are harmful to people and so forth. And in that case, they are abusing the monk or a nun role it's not helping them and it's not it's not helping the society so that could be more articulated more in the future because we are there is a big difference in the modern situation and the previous situation which is the previous were basically agricultural societies with a small literate urban population and or, or an uh, elite population and the small elite and urban population there was no such idea of universal education and uh, we may overdo our notion of universal education and we may be over-educating some people who don't need it and it makes them even unhappy. But uh, there are critiques like that. Let's have more apprenticeship programs, you know, and so forth for people whose, you know, academic scoring is low. But, and that may be so, but the case is we do have the wonderful thing 
of universal literacy, which Buddha would have applauded had it existed in his time, which Buddha would applaud if he were here today. So more people can really use the educational aspect of the Buddhist sciences and the Buddhist ethical and social traditions and things like that. And that's really valuable. It doesn't mean they need to be Buddhist, but it means that Buddhism can offer its services to a much wider percentage of the population. And it's unrealistic economically, and industrial society is governed by a certain social ethic where sort of no free lunch societies, it's kind of unrealistic to expect those societies right away to jump in and have like a hundred or a thousand times the number of monks and nuns that the Catholics will, will inflict on them. <laughs> it's not realistic. So, so there, there are new models that can be devised, but still, this, that the idea that I always say that when people say, is Buddhism reached the West, you know, when Buddhist monasticism is fully respected and supported by Western Buddhists, at least, then Buddhist, Buddhism has reached the country. If it's not supported by Buddhists, even by Buddhists, then I would say Buddhism is not really here. But Buddhist ideas and Buddhist practices, but Buddhism isn't there until you have, a, you have a true respect for what the avocation of the monk and the nun, the celibate bhikshu and bhikshu, which really you say male and female mendicant, bhikshu and bhikshuni, that is people who need the free lunch and who expect it and who receive it from a grateful population that they are putting their efforts so strongly and they're prioritizing so greatly their personal development for the sake of everyone, which is a real thing. That motivate, even though they may be withdrawn in a cave, but the fact that they're doing it for everyone, their ultimate goal is to be a Buddha for everyone, which is the Bodhisattva way, is, is important. It's not just a verbal uh, thing to excuse hiding in a cave, not at all. If you do it just for yourself, it has one value, but it, it's sort of minimalist value, but which is, still has value, but minimalist. But if you're doing it motivated for all beings, like Bodhisattva motivation, it has much greater value. And, uh, and it is a social act, actually. Okay, so ding, that's answered that one. So now, what is Buddha nature? Okay, so Buddha nature is an English term developed on Tathagata Garbha, is the original Sanskrit term. Tathagata means Buddha, of course, it's the name of Buddha, but it's particularly picking out in among the names of Buddha, the name of the Buddha as a transcended being or transcendent being in the sense of one who transcended their normal absolutist identity habits, including the nihilistic absolutism of that, sort of, that, that in their absence, everything is really ultimately nothing. So someone who has gone into an experience of the nature of reality uh, go on or come into an experience of the nature of reality, gata or agata, uh, where um, they fully experience what it is accurately and precisely. And, and this knowledge and this experience makes them released from suffering, happy nirvana at some type level to some degree. And, um, and so that uh, is... Um, That's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's then, then, yes, then the potential that everyone has to achieve that type of a being, to transcend their narrow self-definition and self-experience of myself as this thing isolated inside my skin, you know, from inside my material body, and maybe as just only a material being, but rigidly I am always me, or a spiritual one, I'm always me with such and such a soul, it could be the variety it would still be a rigid identity habit pattern. And, um, uh, but within that, I have a nature of a potential to really experience that my reality is interrelated with all things and all beings. You know, people wrongly think that Buddha discovered that some place outside the world where you go and that Nirvana is outside the world. Even some Buddhists still think that. But actually, Buddha was pretty clear that that means relativity. What's outside the world is an absolute version of the world that is your version belonging to you. What is, you know, what is, what is not there is a self that is an absolute unchanging fixed self within your relational being. What is there is your relational self, which is constantly changing and influenced by 
all your its possessions, its embodiment, its circumstances, its society. So the Buddha nature, therefore, is that potential. Now, when the it is said in the more sophisticated, I always thought, therefore, it was it was emptiness itself in some way, because I was foolishly thinking that emptiness is a thing, <laughs> which I'm afraid people do. They they even have an experience which feels like they're float. They they are emptiness. They don't feel even like they're floating in it. They just feel they have become it. That everything is empty, including the self, and they think that's enlightenment. And it is a it is a shocking experience, but it is an enlightenment. Actually, we have to be very clear. And uh, but so that. But it comes from having the wrong idea that emptiness is a thing, apart from some non-empty thing. There's an empty thing. And that's wrong, because emptiness is also empty. <laughs> emptiness thought of as a thing is also empty. So emptiness actually means relationality, that all things are related. It's really what it means. It means that all things are related of any non-relational essence or component or, or ultimate being or intrinsic reality or intrinsic identity. Everything is empty of that, meaning it's only interrelational. So there, in other words, there's no, there's no indivisible particle, for example. All particles are infinitely divided until they dissolve under analysis. They're divided into where there's nothing to find. They, they're, they're parts are, and then their parts all dissolve under analysis. And Buddha predicted that, which I would say was ratified by quantum physics and announced in 1926 in the Copenhagen Declaration. And it still exists among some physicists in the what they call the Copenhagen interpretation, um, but uh, Buddha discovered that anyway, thousands of years ago, and it was uh, articulated and explicated and elaborated more powerfully. So the Buddha nature, you know, is in a, in a way you can say roughly it is it is emptiness, because the Buddha nature is everyone's natural relativity. Since we are connected all into all interconnected with each other in an infinite relativity. If you can make such a, an expression, you know, an inconceivable relativity, then we all have the chance to relate to positive things to the beings who already are enlightened within that relativity, and and who experience that relativity as nirvana, as love and joy and bliss, as bliss void indivisible, bliss freedom indivisible, nirvana samsara non dual, and. Uh, you can yourself become one of them, rather than become one of their patients, one of their clients, <laughs> seeking freedom from suffering with their help, or with beings like them with their help. So that that's in that sense, Buddha nature is emptiness, you can say. But then on the other hand, there's Buddha, Buddha nature has sort of two uses in two different divisions of Buddhist thought, which is really beautiful. And this relates to a book that I recently worked on the translation, a book by one of Tsongkhapa's disciples, Gyal Tsepje, his first successor, like his Maha, Tsongkhapa's Mahakashapa, you could say, uh, which is called the Sublime Continuum Super Commentary, which uh, we just published from Columbia University through Columbia University Press, our Institute of Buddhist Studies. And in that, I learned a wonderful thing that I was not aware of before, that in the mind-only school, or the idealistic school of Buddhism, called Vinyanavada, or mind-only, Chittamatra, something like that Sanskrit word, then the Buddha nature is sort of like a little mini-Buddha. You know, the Buddha kind of allows people who have a strong attachment to having a fixed soul that is belonging individually to them, but is somehow yet absolute. That they have a Buddha, they, well, they don't have one of those, but they have a Buddha nature. And he knows that they're going to understand that Buddha nature as some fixed thing that they have, sort of a new fixed thing that they have, their eventual Buddhahood, sort of seminally inside, almost like a Sankhya understanding of, of Buddhas, of, of, of idealistic thought. And uh, that's an Indian philosophical school that thinks the cause pre exists in the effect. And so that's one form of it. But the Prasangika Madhyamaka form, or the Madhyamaka, or centrist form of it, is more exciting and kind of more fun. Where it's, um, what it is, is it's the way you are, it's your nature as understood by Buddha. Because you have to understand, when someone becomes a Buddha, it's not like they are, see themselves as one with Nirvana and other beings are still 
lost in the swamp and in vicious suffering and in terrible health and whatever. It isn't like that. They see Buddha would break their Buddha, Buddhas would have broken their Bodhisattva vows at Buddhahood if they abandoned beings into a realm of suffering and themselves entered a realm of nirvana without bringing them with them. What it is, it's more subtle and more nuanced than that. Buddhas see other beings in the reality of the other beings, which is that they are all in nirvana, made of nirvana, that their reality is bliss, that the strong force of the universe is clear light of bliss, which is infinitely and infinite in its power, infinite in its extent. Um, then the, the question always comes up, like, what is anger? Why can't I have my anger? People want to know. People want to know. And uh, actually, when it's ladies in Western society, uh, and the Eastern too, who want to know, like, why can't I have my anger? Middle, usually they're going to be middle class, uh, educated ladies. Uh, there's no good answer to them, actually. They should have their anger because the males who are socialized to show anger quickly and domineeringly, um, they feel are pushing them around and they're probably usually right. They've been pushed around a lot. And they're socialized to, to accept and to be tolerant and be gentle and meek. And um, in a way, actually, they're more capable of being meek. They have a better, uh, tend to have better self-control and so on. So, because they are, from a Buddhist point of view, they are more advanced, actually, the females, in my opinion, so, um, than males. But um, in just no, no generality is valid everywhere, of course. But um, I think the thing is, what do we, how do we define anger? I wrote a book called Anger. Oxford University Press. I think there's a German translation um, and uh, other European language, Italian, I know there is, Spanish. Um, and I was surprised that I discovered that anger really is the big, big word among the moralist writings, you know, in English, even back to Chaucer and then uh, Greeks, Plutarch and people like that, Italians and um, the, the Stoics. And uh, the, the anger that they say is one of the seven deadly sins, and therefore really quite bad, is the one that sweeps you off your normal, rational self-control. And you become possessed by it, as they would put it. You become furioso. And, um, and then you do destructive things. And you are not effective in dealing with the situation from the moralist point of view. And Buddhist moralists would absolutely agree. The locus classicus of it is in, the, of course, in all Abhidharma, but in Mahayana literature, it's the Shantideva's writing. And, um, and there he gives a very good analysis of it. And therefore, in English, I think when we say, what is anger, and I probably in other European languages, uh, it is probably the degree of anger where you lose self-control and you blow up, as we say. And, and, um, and Shantideva's analysis of it is you at first are frustrated when you see something happening you don't think should be happening. When something you think should be happening, you see it being prevented or blocked from being happening. You then feel frustrated. And as that frustration builds up, it becomes more and more painful to you. And then anger in the form of your own mind, in the voice of your own inner monologue, your own inner identity speaking, comes to you and says, well, you can't do anything about that because you're too weak. But if you use me and blow up and get all overheated, you'll be stronger. And you will be able to rectify this situation, either make the good thing happen or prevent the bad thing from happening. And then you blow up, and then you go after whatever it is. And um, however, the problem is that in some cases it may actually, to some degree, be helpful. Like when you run away from something, you know, uh, you know, you get an adrenaline charge, you know, and you leap away from something out of fear, you know. 
But unfortunately, with, out of anger, where you go crashing into a situation, when you're not under self any kind of control, there are studies today that say you lose 85% of your good judgment. And Shantideva also agrees you become the tool of your anger. Your body and mind and speech become tools of your anger. And anger dominates you. Anger is like the demon that tells you what to tell them what to do. You say things that you don't mean, you do physical things and hurt people that you didn't want to. You you know, you, you lose control, you become the tool of your anger, your body, speech, and mind. You hit people, you hurt people, you kill people, you hurt yourself maybe physically, you do something, bang your head on the wall, you angrily drive your car into something and get killed yourself, and or you kill someone else or hurt them badly, you break things that you value, you feel regretful afterwards, and verbally you'll say things you don't mean and people will be deeply hurt and you feel badly afterwards. And mentally you have hostile mind and you destroy something or someone in your mind. And all of these things cause really have very negative results for you, as well as for the situation. They don't really have good results. Perhaps in old fashioned warfare, you know, they say that Alexander the Great, you know, they have the, we have the expression in of a berserker. And Alexander the Great would go berserk on the battlefield in his early battles when he still fought himself. And he would be kind of unopposable and he would sweep people down by the, by the dozen, you know, type of thing. Because he was just so, he'd be possessed by this fury, you see. So there, you know, in that kind of a, but of course, all those people he killed all get reborn and then they come after him in the form of the Indians or the Afghanis or whoever it was who finally killed him. And in other lives, you know, so in a way, from Buddhist point of view, it never helps. It's always destructive. However, if you want to define anger as just a kind of heat of vigor, strong energy that you feel when you see something wrong and you want to fix it, or you protest or you, and you see something right and you get you eliminate opposition to that, you know, there can be like a kind of righteous, strong feelings about ethics or to help another being or something. This won't do, this won't stand, you know, where you still very able to make judgments. You can even be reserved about flipping out. You know? And that we can make that positive. That can be positive determination. That can be willpower. You know, We can say that we're in charge of it. So then when women, uh, when women react angrily, and we would say speak a little angrily, say they interrupt you, you're about to say a long bunch of stupid things, and a woman sort of forcefully and rather, and you would think maybe angrily interrupts you, but she's still cheerful. She might make a joke out of it, or she might, but after opposing you, might make you realize how silly it all was, or whatever it is, you know, because she has a good humor and she's skillful. If she really has suppressed herself for a long time about some bad thing, some stupid things you are saying, or whatever, and blows up at you, then you know both you and she will feel wounded. You know, if you're not, if you're, if you have no, not good control of your own anger, you'll be angry back and then it'll be a terrible fight. So the thing there is to do it quickly. And Shantideva has a beautiful thing. He says, intervene in the situation while you're still cheerful. Your good cheer is the source of your positive actions. So don't let it be eaten away by frustration. When you start being frustrated, do something about it. If there's nothing you can do about it, get away from the situation. It doesn't do any good to blow up and add being really angry and freaked out and bitter and so forth to being impotent in a situation. Just go and relieve the situation. So he gives clues like that. So it doesn't just amount to suppressing your anger. Of course, the ultimate way of overcoming anger is where you don't feel angry because you real you feel sorry for the people who are harmful to you or who would cause you anger. So that you feel you might want to resist them and you might be forceful, but you will never be angry because you're not trying to eradicate them from the universe. You're just trying to stop them doing their stupid thing. And you somehow feel that there is some element to them that is more than that anger of theirs. You know? So that's a positive way of dealing with anger. So the so the best way is Shantideva's way, you know. Be vigorous, be forceful, like a martial arts person, without being angry. That's the best way of dealing with it. And be that way with anger itself, actually, finally, which is where you 
The one thing in Shantideva's thing that you're allowed to be angry with is anger <laughs> itself. So when you're angry with anger, then your absolute fury turns back on absolute fury, then you only can be relatively, you only act relatively in any other sense, because you sort of destroy the fury that would make you act non-relationally. And therefore, the people who are most violent and terrible when they get angry are those who have left intact the sense of absolute identity. So then when their voice, inner voice says, you've got to get that person, they can't, you can't be in the same world with them, you know, like the six shooter, you know, you know, the, the draw, you know, like this town's not big enough for the both of us sort of routine. Uh, then uh, those are the people who, it's, so it's really a derivative of the self-absolutizing habit pattern, the identity habit that I call. You know, it's a, it's a derivative of that anger, the real, the real destructive anger, okay? So that's that one. Ding! So, how can we learn to love our enemies? How can we do that? It's really difficult. And there, let's say, let's look at, first of all, what is an enemy? An enemy is someone that we fear and we hate and we avoid or we want to destroy because they have harmed us or we imagine they will harm us and hurt us and so on. So that's the enemy. And um, love is defined as the will to the happiness of the beloved. So I love something in the Buddhist view, at least to, especially towards sensitive beings. In a way, even if you love your book, you don't want to see it harmed or destroyed. You know, so it, you don't want the book to be happy <laughs> necessarily, but uh, you don't want to see it hurt. The book, you don't want it to be burned, destroyed, lost, etc. You want it to be kept in a good condition. But it, toward a person, you want that person to be free of suffering and to feel happiness. And happiness, what tends to, when you feel happy, your happiness overflows. Therefore, in a way, the secret of, of true love, in a way, is happiness. And, and uh, the feeling that, uh, and there is an initial happiness, even if you don't sort of think that you're feeling happy, when you're not thinking about how you're feeling, because you're so fascinated by someone that you just, all you care about is how are they you do feel happier right away by not worrying about how you are. That's an important point that Shantideva and makes and His Holiness makes and nowadays and Buddha made. So being loving is makes you happy actually. And for example, in the meditational realm of immeasurable love, the first three heavenly planes of the realm of pure form, of uh, desire-free form, uh, greed-free form, then they say that uh, when you reach there, it's like this brilliant radiance of happiness that you feel. You, you don't really, you're not after anything, but you just feel happy from the way things are. Something like that. And precisely because you're free of a desire of thinking that you're not happy and you need something that will make you happy. That's how the immeasurable, the first dhyana it's called, first contemplative realm, the first brahma vihara, the first pure or divine abode. So, so, okay, so therefore, now, the enemy who harms you, why does he harm you or she harm you? Because it thinks you are blocking its happiness. So the enemy is harmful to you in an attempt to be happy. If you can sort of see that, understand that, and you want them to be happy, then you or wishing them to be in a condition where they wouldn't feel they need to get you out of their way. So it's actually practical advice from Jesus, from Buddha. It's a very practical advice. Love your enemy means you want your enemy to be happy. If your enemy is happy without being your enemy, your enemy will be bored to be your enemy because they'll be too happy to bother with it. And therefore, they will no longer be your enemy and you will not have to fear them or fight them or whatever it is. So loving your enemy is a sensible thing. And it should not be misunderstood as meaning, oh, he wants, he thinks I'm in the way of his happiness, so he wants to harm me, so he's my enemy. So that means I should go and have him harm me, and then he'll be happy? No. 
because actually by harming someone doesn't make him happy. You are actually not the one who is blocking his happiness. His own inner confusion is blocking his happiness. His under not understanding his own nature is what's blocking his happiness. So it's a diversion and it makes him more unhappy to harm you actually because then subliminally, subconsciously, he realized he did a wrong thing and he created an enemy out of you in some way and you become a new danger for him. And you are a new danger for him. Actually, if you're an ordinary person, you'll want revenge. Even if you die, you'll be reborn seeking revenge. In the Buddhist, more sensible world, you, where life is endlessly continuous, you know, there's no notion of life becoming nothing, something, some energy, some process becoming nothing. That's considered an incoherent and unevidenced idea. And the idea of continuum of consciousness as well as physical matter and energy is considered normal and commonsensical. So, okay, so that's, uh, that's why you should learn, to, and you learn to do so by being more realistic. You don't just think of your enemy as a sharp uh, tip of the spear coming at you. You think of the enemy as the person wielding the spear, and you see that the person is wielding that because they're forced to do so by this that circumstance. And you knew if they were really happy enough, they would not enroll in that army. They wouldn't obey that order. They would feel too happy to bother you. And so you, you employ that, but you might do so at a distance because you, the worst thing that would happen would be that your loving your enemy would be cut short by being killed by the spear. Although if you extremely loved your enemy, even they kill you by the spirit, you'd still love them. You'd be reborn with love. You wouldn't be one reborn out of revenge if you extremely like love. And you can find this in all religious and spiritual traditions. It's not specifically Buddhist. Buddhists it may be more technically analytic about it until some kind of modern psychology that's catching up. What is the middle way? What is the middle way? We hear a lot about the middle way in Buddhism. And what is it? Well, there's two kinds, at least two kinds of middle way, actually. And one of them is the middle way between, which was the first one that Buddha mentioned after his enlightenment. And he said, when I was a prince, I was very self-indulgent and the world was very indulgent with me. And I had experienced every pleasure and everyone catered to me, my ego and what I wanted and etc. So I was very, very overindulged in sensory pleasure. And then when I became an ascetic and a seeker, I got into the opposite and I decided my body was the problem and I was going to mortify it to the absolute. I was going to seek whatever you could find and that was enlightening about pain. And I was inflicting pain. I was damaging myself and I was extremely self-mortifying and overly ascetical. So my first middle way was a middle way where I restrain myself from excessive sensory indulgence and I also restrain any tendency to sort of self-punish or self-mortify. And so middle way was I live in a pleasant way of being, but I refrain from being indulged in that and I therefore spend my focus on trying to find out my nature and find out reality and educate myself ethically, psychologically and scientifically. And uh, that's the middle way. That's the first middle way. Then the second middle way is the middle way that uh, is unpacked in the Transcendent Wisdom Sutras by the Buddha and a little bit more inchoately or hintingly even in the Theravada Suttas, the Pali Suttas. He was always into the middle way there. And that is the middle way between absolutism, sometimes or eternalism as they sometimes call it, when you focus on the impermanence permanence duality uh, and nihilism or where you think that well it's not absolute then it doesn't exist at all and those are two extremes of worldview that there's an absolute like absolute the absolutist theism absolutist self-centrism there's all kinds of ways of perceiving things something as absolute and then the opposite is seeing it as really nothing it just all dissolves into nothing it's all nothing and that's nihil, and there's no consequence, and there's and that's nihilism. And the, there the middle way is between absolutism and nihilism, and as I said in another one of my answers, we could call it a good kind of relativism. 
So it's where things are relational and there are some strong rules and relative absolutes within the relativity, but they're never absolutely absolute. And there's no nothing, also everything is relative and nothing is the, is the one thing that is not there. So it's, 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 there is no nothingness, in other words, there's a, there's a, except as a concept. And uh, you can create a state that might seem to you like your preconception of nothingness, but it would just be in a way you're experiencing your own concept, really, basically. You're creating a space in your mind that seems to fit your concept, reifying as something. So, um, so that's called a middle way. And then there's a school of, of philosophy after Nagarjuna, after he rediscovers Mahayana and he writes his famous six works and his critique and so on. And that school is called the Madhyamaka school. So, and the Madhyama means the middle, or it can also mean the center, Madhyama. And um, the K part is what makes a middle or making a middle, or taking a middle, madhyamaka. It's a thing suffix, as they say, and it's a, it gives a sense of agency, so staying to the middle, or making the middle, the school is, you know, or the mental process is, depending on how the vowels are, madhyamaka. And, but then this may creates an awkward thing in English, where you don't have an ist word for it, because you can't really say he's a philosophical middleist. It sounds like some kind of disease. So I think I use the word centrist, which I think is really quite right about it. It's a centrist. It's a centrist between annihilation and absoluteness. And it's, it's, it, it's in that being that it says that there are relative absolutes, of course, you know, like don't kill. That's, that's almost always the case. The relatively absolute means it's almost always right. Don't be violent. Don't harm. That's almost always right. Sometimes you may need to to prevent someone else, for example, who's about to kill a million people or something. You can only stop them with a long shot and uh, you have to kill, then you should actually. So in that sense, it's not absolute, but it's relatively absolute. And, um, and similarly, it's good to annihilate certain things like bad habits. So in, within relativity, you can, you can be annihilationist about negativities, okay? And, um, and, then so, and then those things that are really unimportant are relatively nothing. And so you can use such terms. So rel relativism is more flexible and it's really a good thing. And then I like to say that school is a centrist school. And those who are members of the centrist school, of the, and there, that has several different varieties, are... Um, are following the middle way, or you could call it the central way. When we think of center, we think maybe of four corners of a square or a circle, the circumference of a circle, then there's a center. Whereas middle, we think there are two things and you're in the between, you're going down a road and you're in the middle of the road, which has two sides. But, um, but uh, you can also be in the center of the road, even though you never get to the end. So there's, so it's not it's got four sides, it's only two sides. You can still call that center. So, so that's the thing on that, okay? So that's the middle way, all right? Ding! Um, you know, then there's this whole worry about celebrities and Buddhism, which people have, who, depending on whether they're very purist, or they're maybe too casual. You know what, it might be, say what you could call the commodification of Buddhism, leads to the commodification of Buddhism. And part of that would be then where celebrity becomes really important and people want to run out and be a Buddhist because they heard Richard Gere was a Buddhist, or they heard that uh, Sharon Stone was a Buddhist or something, or Sharon Stone liked the Dalai Lama, or Sharon Stone used, while somewhat misunderstanding, the theory of karma. <laughs> Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Well, you know, like everything, celebrity culture has its problems. The idea that we look to celebrities as models of what to do. But on the other hand, who was one of the first great celebrities of the ancient world? Buddha. <laughs> Buddha might have been the outstanding celebrity of the ancient world. In the sense that, the, that India was much more populous than West Asia or Europe at that time. 
And uh, China, then later when it goes to China, then again, you have all the Chinese have heard of Buddha, as they call it, Fo. So, so celebrity um, thing is, is natural in human societies. People sort of, you know, look at those who are famous for good or bad reasons. And they, if they are good reasons, then they want to be like them. And that has a positive effect. And someone who becomes famous should take that responsibility and show good examples. And often they do, actually. If they stay, want to stay famous for that, they can tend to do that. So the use of celebrity in, uh, in sort of making Buddhism useful and known, therefore, has the same problems that it does in any other element. And, uh, but basically, one thing, which is if we, if we really take the pledge, you know, make the pledge that we're not trying to convert people to Buddhism. We're just trying to convert them to thinking more clearly themselves as Christians, Muslims, secularists, Taoists, Jews, whatever they are. And uh, then, uh, you know, we're not trying to really do anything, promote Buddhism, but in a way, since we're dealing in societies where some people think like Buddhism is demonic or satanic, since it isn't Jesus' way, then it must be, even though it sounds like Jesus, like love your enemy, don't be angry, you know, be happy, and you know, see the flowers in the field as divine providence, etc. Think of the divine as goodness, benevolence, the universe is good, basically good. It sounds a lot like Buddhism, but since it isn't Christianity, they're demonic and they're satanic and all this. So in a context of that, that celebrities say, no, Buddhism is a good thing, it's okay. I like Buddhism. And some of them might be reluctant to say, I am a Buddhist, because they would feel maybe then they would not get the um, ticket buyers who would be Christians or other kinds of religious fanatics. They think, why do I go to this concert or this person or see this movie when this weirdo is a Buddhist? But I think that, that stigma is not so much there. So that's not, that's, a, that's not a big question. That's an easy question, everybody. And uh, what is the relevance of Dalai Lama in today's world? That's very important. Here, uh, my latest book, or latest two books in a way, almost sort of popular books that are uh, academic uh, translations of the Tenure, which is my life's main work, translating all the great teachings of the 17 great pundits of Nalanda, who are still celebrities today, Nagarjuna, Sangha, Vasubandhu. In the Buddhist world, they're still celebrities. And um, um, my two latest books, one was called Why the Dalai Lama Matters, His Act of Truth as the Solution for China, Tibet, and the World, was that one, which was a, a, a you know, like a popular a trade book, as they call it, but um, wasn't that tremendously popular, but was pretty popular. Um, and um, in the sense of uh, the argument there was that people who purport to like the Dalai Lama as a holy man and as some kind of a charming sort of global celebrity, which he himself is, definitely, and he wins worldwide popularity concerts by journalists and things, along with the Pope and certain movie actresses and things, people like that. And um, I think Obama was up there a couple of times. Angela Merkel. She's up there in my popularity contest. And uh, and yet people say about the Dalai Lama, well, he should stay out of politics. You know, he doesn't know what's going on in the world. His nonviolence has not helped Tibet all this time. He really can't do anything against the Chinese Imperium and the People's Liberation Army with nonviolence. And even some Tibetans will say that even though they revere him and oh, our Dalai Lama, but you know, he should stay out of politics. His, his wisdom is not relevant to history and the way things are happening in the world. And so there's a kind of ignoring his role. Well, he's a Nobel Peace Prize guy and that's, he's just as unrealistic as the rest of the Nobel Peace Prize guys. And as the Norwegians, for that matter, in giving these Nobel Peace Prize to people and the world isn't like that. It's ruled by violence and militaries and and, and hard-nosed, you know, tough people and 
and it's might makes right. So he should stay out of it. Well, I don't. I think that's that was wrong in Socrates' day. You know, in his uh, argument against uh, Themistocles, and it's wrong today. And who is upholding the Socratic point of view that violence is destructive, and that violence leads to more violence, and that it's practical to be kind and to use dialogue to resolve conflict and to forswear violence and let your opponent realize that your opposition has reasoning behind it and then he has reasoning behind his position and the two of you will try to reason it out, come up with a middle way, be centrist, you know. That's the way of dealing with it and violence will just bring more counter-violence and is no good and he's the one whose teaching is that. He is the one who is a living teacher of that Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, Taoist, Confucian teaching, indigenous people's teaching. Anywhere where they feel that their ideas and worldviews are responsible for trying to keep the peace in the world with the neighbors and so on, at whatever level it is, whether it's the family, the tribe, or the nation, the city-state, the nation, or the planet ultimately, but or the species, whatever it is, this is the general consensus. And the Dalai Lama is the sort of world celebrity and in a way leader of world leaders. He's a leader, he's a political leader also, until he resigned recently, but he still is ethically and morally. A political leader of a country who's lost his country, so he's in exile. And so therefore he's a leader of a, he's a leader of responsible for a country without the country. So in a way he's very vulnerable and weak and yet, and he's been very badly displaced and badly violated actually, and his people have, and yet he insists on responding nonviolently with the calls for dialogue, with feeling there's a win-win situation with his oppressor, rather than he has to now oppress his oppressor and kill him and get rid of him and get revenge on him. He's not into that. So that makes him, and since militarism is one of our lethal problems confronting us as a world, you know, Putin and Trump sitting there could decide they really don't like each other, mutual oligarchs go get in their bunkers thinking they might survive with a few girlfriends, press the buttons and obliterate everybody, which would actually then obliterate them both too. But they so, so it's kind of people who get so egocentric and so out of touch with reality, poor things. So frustrated because of being out of touch with reality, they might, they're liable to be destructive of reality because they're out of touch with it. They'll delude themselves that they can escape the consequence of it. So, since that's a major problem, then the Dalai Lama's teaching about that, living proponent of the view that that is not good, is very important. And that's why he matters. And to China and Tibet in particular in the relation of that, because that's one of his primary concerns, Chinese are harming themselves by harming the Tibetans. By harming the Tibetan environment, they're harming the sources of their rivers. By cutting the Tibetan primeval forests up the river valleys, they're causing flood and siltation and horrible disasters for themselves and the overall climate. By overgrazing the Tibetan steppe, for commercial meat uh, production, they are desertifying the steppe by bringing out too many and the wrong kind of animals. And they're ruining the monsoon cycle and they're destroying their ecology, but then so hurting themselves. So that's a very important example. And then my last book with two co-authors is called Man of Peace, the Illustrated life story of his holy of the Dalai Lama of Tibet and this is a must read for everyone to show that he walks his talk that he has responded nonviolently consistently in his life that he has developed himself consistently he didn't just sit on his laurels I'm Dalai Lama so I'm just enlightened no matter what I do no he uh, tries to become less e less egocentric less angry some as he puts it less uh, less frightened of things and more enlightened and he definitely has succeeded. I can testify from 53 years of personal experience. He has definitely improved enormously as a Dalai Lama. He's a better Dalai Lama than he was earlier, which might seem sacrilegious to some who say, well, he always was Abhavakadeshvara incarnation, it's like the Buddhist Messiah. 
But I don't mean that. And part of his incarnation is to incarnate in a human form where he is more or less perfectible and more or less deterioratable, imperfectible, and go either way. So that's his kindness to come and be more like us and then show us the way of perfecting himself, becoming wonderful and more marvelous and more appreciated by people. And therefore, people more, that becomes then the credibility uh, reasoning, evidence. But then his teaching becomes more credible if he himself has become more better by following it himself. So that's why the Dalai Lama's role is really, really important. And it's very tragic, but I hope it will be short-lived at this stage. It's been long-lived, really since 1950, when Mao first decided to invade Tibet. Mao and Deng Xiaoping and Mao Zedong decided to invade Tibet to add that to their imperium, their land base. So he's been waiting for proper treatment from the Chinese leadership for a long time. All the other world leaders who are sane, like him, he's met most of them, actually, even before they were, like he met Obama as a senator, you know, he met, uh, and then he saw him as a president, you know, he met, he didn't meet the Bushes before they were, he met George Bush when he was a kid in the family, first family of the older Bush, but then he straight on met the older Bush. But anyway, he met Angela Merkel when she was the Secretary of Education. He met the premier of, of Colombia when he was something else. No, but he really has met it because as a Nobel Peace Prize laureate traveling the world, most distinguished people have wanted to meet him and they have and they've been touched by him. So they like him and they're kind of distressed, but they're scared and they have to do business with China when China does this thing about don't talk to him or we're never going to talk to you. Now that they're rich and they're throwing money around, they're foolishly ruling him, you know, they're depriving themselves of his good advice and his presence and his blessing. And the ones who are most deprived of his blessing are the Chinese themselves, who by adopting this false, which they know to be false, they say he's a splittist, he's an evil this, he's a fake lama. But they know that's not true, actually. Xi Jinping's father was extremely fond of the Dalai Lama, for example, Xi Zhongshong, and his mother too. And so he knows that the Dalai Lama is actually a good person and, and wants the good of China and the Chinese people too. And doesn't have anything much that much against the leaders, although when they do harm his people, he feels it's really regrettable. And they're being really stubborn in their, in their stupidity, harming themselves by harming other people. So his role it couldn't be more important here in America that we love him is really important. And even in the, if you take a really long view of the planet and you see racism as a major, major danger, sort of the blow up, the ultimate blow up of tribalism, where there can be genocides and there can be, and genocide with people with nuclear weapons can lead to mutual self-destruction, you know, mutual assured destruction, actually. And so in that context, one of the great events of 20th and 21st century begun a little bit in 19th century, is the meeting of the so-called Caucasian, white, whitish type of people, who are really blotchy pink more than white, but anyway, they call themselves white, and the yellow people, the Chinese people, who are hugely numerous, you know, they're like 1.5 billion. And Western people, like a lot of the Indian, Indian, a lot of the Indian languages are like an Indo-European language, so they're sort of the West, actually, in relation to China. So if this, if the, if the harmonious meeting, if the sense of mutual sense of ability for beings with, across races and across nations to be able to identify with each other across ethnicities where they don't want to exterminate each other and they are going to get along, therefore, with each other as fellow human beings, which should, could, should also, of course, be extended to animals as fellow sentient beings. Then the Dalai Lama is someone who is ethnically close to the Chinese racially although ethnically different, since Chinese and Tibetan are ethnically different, but close. And the Tibetans have been relating to the Chinese for thousands of years, often as enemies, but never as owners. They never think of them, they don't think of themselves as Chinese, but they can identify and relate to them. And also as a Buddhist, since Chinese were madly Buddhist for thousands of years, the Chinese people are very, very fond of the Dalai Lama, as is visible whenever he goes to Taiwan or 
Singapore or Singapore or Chinese Chinatowns in America or Europe, he's massively popular with Chinese people. And he's very popular with Caucasian people. Russians love him. Uh, Putin just doesn't give a visa because he's scared of the Chinese policy about that at the moment. And he's, and he's, he's alienated from the Europeans because of his aggressiveness. And so he thinks he needs the partnership of the Chinese. Although he's the Russian-Chinese mutual self-identification is not very strong indeed, actually. But um, so Dalai Lama is beloved everywhere. So he should be a great mediating force if China accepted him as their dear friend, as he wants to be, and he is their best friend. If they accepted him like that, the Chinese leadership, that would satisfy the Chinese people. They'd be delighted. And then he could be the best goodwill ambassador for all the foreign people, non-Chinese people, who love the Dalai Lama. It's a total, it's a, it's a tragedy that they didn't like, wake up to this back when he got the Nobel Prize and, and he be, have access of the whole planet, including the huge Chinese part of it, which he feels very strongly connected to. And he doesn't want to split Tibet from it. Chinese have ruined lots of parts of Tibet. They've extracted and ruined. Therefore, they should rebuild, he feels that. They're a big, powerful economy. It's good for Tibet to be connected with them. They share Buddhism. It's good to be connected with them. He has lots of reasons other than just, you know, can't fight them, to want to be connected to China, but not if they're not benevolent. The Chinese, the Tibetan patriots, you know, who wouldn't listen to Dalai Lama's advice not to fight violently, Kambas and Amdavas, who did fight and lost, of course, because he said they would, and there's no point in doing that, but they are capable of it, though. Dalai Lama has caused them to fight against their inner enemy, their anger and hatred and bitterness and egotism enough at least to not continue that fight and with the terrorism and things since then they haven't done that since they had that first war of resistance in the 50s and early 60s so he's, he's immensely important on the planet is my point and everyone should read Man of Peace the illustrated life story of the Dalai Lama of Tibet which I hope will come out in a German edition soon too and French edition, and Czech edition, and Russian edition, and Scandinavian edition, we, we feel certain it will. His Holiness himself loves it, although it's not an authorized biography. We sometimes call it a graphic novel, because we cast the Dalai Lama in some situations in a heroic light, where he would underplay it with his Buddhist monk, simple Buddhist monk, humility. He would not claim credit for this and that thing that happened in the world during his life, on his watch. And we wanted to highlight his contribution there. So we don't, it wasn't authorized, but he likes the biography. And his, even more important, his staff liked it. <laughs> his secretaries and people who are often very critical of things people do about the Dalai Lama. So, <clears throat> so that's the Dalai Lama role. So then last question for today is... Um, Geshe Wangyal's role. Well, now Geshe Wangyal, Zanji Lady Tenemete, which, which he once told me to say anytime I ever mentioned his name in the future. And Tibetan means I mentioned his name for a purpose. And uh, it's a sort of Tibetan custom. Your root teacher, which is sort of like your father and mother, it's your third parent, it's your spiritual parent, you could say. You don't mention their name casually, like, because in a way, their spiritual presence, like, you know, in the Star Wars, you have Obi-Wan Kenobi hovering over there saying, Luke, trust the Force. So a highly evolved being like that can remain present spiritually to the beings that they, they are mentoring. And so when you call on them, it kind of stirs them up in their subtle form. And so you only do it for a certain purpose, and I'm doing it because he was such a great person and because he exemplified. And especially today in the time when Sadly, even some Tibetan teachers have joined the ranks of the gurus who have exploited their guru relationship, like the psychiatrists who've exploited their transference with the patients to get se have sex with them or to, ex to exploit them financially or something, or like the priest who exploits the choir boys, or like the, you know, they've joined the long list of people who've used charisma and spiritual 
authority to extract worldly favors from people in the most unspiritual and unholy manner. And unfortunately, there are some Tibetans who have joined this, and, and they, of course, it didn't just happen. In the past, there were them too. And actually, there were they had such beings in Tibet, who they had to continuously try to police within their own system, uh, which done basically by the students themselves, learning about Buddhism and understanding it well enough to realize when the teacher is bad, behaving badly, and using rationalizations and excuses of why they're allowed to do so, which is not that they should not be allowed to do so. They are not allowed to do so. You know, there may be exceptional things where they do something unusual, but never harmful and never abusive. So, um, in that light, Geshe Wangyu was a wonderful mentor. He was a wonderful model. As a Geshe, Geshe is a degree like he's a PhD, like a doctor of philosophy or something in uh, the Tibetan monastic university tradition uh, from Drebung Gomang College, he, university and college. He was, uh, uh, he had a Geshe degree and he was very learned and so forth. So he had, he, he had taught in Columbia University actually, but language, he taught the language there. Uh, in the Middle Eastern department before I knew him. And um, so he did, and he had a lot of private students and personal students like me, eventually became his student. And he was a total earthquake for me. But his thing was, he was not really seeking to create an empire of Dharma centers. He really was there to benefit those who sought his help. Whether, and that he didn't think that everyone should be Buddhist either. He would tell people, go back to your, break, go see your rabbi. You know, he would tell somebody, go back and help your mother. He didn't want to recruit people into being monks or nuns. He did not. Unless, I mean, he would not oppose it if it could be helpful to them. In my case, he knew I was sincerely wanted to be a monk, but he knew that I would not have the support. And I had to, didn't have the kind of destiny to do that because he was clairvoyant for sure. I know for a fact he was clairvoyant. Not by that I'm clairvoyant and know that, but by the way he intervened in different situations in my life, knowing exactly what was going on in my head. And uh, he was a great person. And he, he was there. I actually said it all in the very first meeting I had with him when I was leaving, having been sent off by him to go back and take up a job in India with Tibetan refugees there and having a ticket in hand, but telling my friend who had driven me there to his little monastery in New Jersey, I'm coming back, I'm studying with this guy, I'm not going back to India until I've had a chance to study with him. This was my teacher. And the guy said, well, why, why is that? You have a ticket to go back, Dalai Lama, Tibetan Lamas in India, blah, blah, blah. How come you're not doing that? Well, just, we met this guy, he gave us a piece of pie, we talked to him. He needs some English teachers for his young monks? Why? And I said, no, on a spiritual level, he is my teacher. And then why? And I said, because he's not there himself. And what I meant by that, and I didn't, it just blurted it out, you know, and I didn't at the time, I think, really know what it meant, and maybe I still don't, but I have a little better sense of it than I did then. And what it means is that, you know, I had been in a lot of religious things, Christian, Sufi, Hindu, and uh, not so many Buddhist uh, ones in, in Asia, but, but yet, because I was just getting started with them in India. But I'd been in a lot of places, and there are these holy gurus who are luminous sometimes. But then you feel you're a little nothing next to them and they're all there about themselves and how do you fit into their agenda is what you feel. And I was always suspicious of that. I wasn't wanting to do a role as a follower and a devotee and, a, and I don't even want to be religious. I still am not that religious in what normal people normally think of as religious. I follow blindly and just think somebody else is going to solve my problem. I, I'm not. <clears throat> and... Uh, I sensed that he didn't have an agenda for me other than the one he articulated, which was that he was seeking an English teacher for his young lamas who had been sent to, to his little lamas area there in New Jersey in order to do, among other things, study more of their own state studies, but also learn English so the Dalai Lama could have them as interpreting monks. This was in the early 60s, you know, 62, you know. So I just knew that he was the kind of, and that, that's the nature of a Buddha. A Buddha doesn't manifest even a body in Buddhist theory, except 
to benefit beings who need to interact with that kind of body, who can't find the sort of subtle body, Obi-Wan Kenobi sort of Buddha, who would just sort of, you know, like, send be a rainbow in front of them or something like that. They need a person who's going to tell them, like, don't put your soy sauce, don't pick up the soy sauce and begin to, like, chip away at their identity and self-indulgence and all this, you know, identity habit and self-preoccupation and self-cherishing habit. You know, someone who does that personally, that's really a needed thing, a great teacher like that. He was that kind of great teacher. And he therefore, he didn't, he was centrifugal as a teacher. People would come and he would serve them as best he could and he would want them to get back into what he felt they really needed to do in life, their job or their family or whatever it was, you know, and, um, and um, be part of their community, which would might mean staying Christian, being Jewish, being, being Muslim, not so many Muslim people visited him, but those who did, whoever it was, he heard, or being secular. And he was like his holiness, he was like that. So his significance is, I think, great in this, that sense still. And um, he's a kind of emanation, you could say, of the great Avalokiteshvara, like his holiness. And he was certainly significant to me. The best piece of advice I've ever received from one of my teachers, well, I would say I daily receive the best piece of advice that I did get from my teacher, the Geshe Wangyal, that I have gotten and do periodically get from my teacher, his oldest, the Dalai Lama, from Ling Tsang Rinpoche, from Sri Tsang Rinpoche, from, from all my different Serkho Rinpoche, my great Taro Toku, my, all my favorite and wonderful, kind Geshe Wangyal, great teachers. But, and, but nowadays I receive from my wife quite a lot and a little bit from some of my children about how to get over yourself, how to be less self-important, less self-involved, and uh, how to be more aware and, and, and have a better time because be more connected well to others and be more, more selfless in action as well as understanding philosophically selfless or meditationally selfless. And I get that advice all the time from my ultimate guru, which is my beloved wife, who teaches me that constantly. And that's the best piece of advice always is be a wise selfish. The Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama puts it as if you're going to be successful, selfish even, be a wise selfish and be altruistic. <laughs> that's so brilliant. It's right from Shantideva, right from Buddha. Because selfish means you want to be happy yourself. But as long as you're being selfish, you're always going to be evaluating where you are and you're never going to be happy enough. So you're always going to be dissatisfied. So when you're altruistic, you begin to focus on whether others are doing well or not, and you bracket or you put a little bit behind your attention. You 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 with you divert your attention from your self situation to other situations, and that immediately makes you feel better. And then, because naturally we are meant to feel better, we are these amazing, gentle, intelligent, sensitive beings. Who are who have the type of soft skin that we do, who have the incredible intelligence that we do, in order to enjoy our presence in the relative world. That's actually the kind of being we are. But then we make it into a horrible torment and a struggle and fear and hatred and greed and envy and pride and delusion and thing by by misunderstanding what we are actually and by not understanding what we are scientifically speaking. So therefore, we, we are afraid of our vulnerability and our sensitivity, which is actually our greatest asset. It's our greatest, that what enables us to understand our environment and our world and our life and its purpose is our sensitivity and intelligence and being in a rel relative situation. So, um, so that's the constant advice I received from my beloved family and friends especially my beloved wife. Okay, my Dakini. Okay, thank you very much. All the best.